I didn't know when the Florida Museum of Photographic Art came up with their exhibit that they were going to name it after pirates and gangsters. And I think that to some extent, pirates and gangsters have kind of become kind of lazy shorthand for Tampa's history and that it's, it's much, much more interesting than um, those two kinds of characters would give it credit for. Um, so I guess first uh, I have to define my own terms as far as what is a rebel? Um, now, I'm not interested in armed insurrectionists or cessation, uh, people interested in secession, like in the Civil War, but cultural revolutionaries. You know, every society is uh, really, and culture is defined from the inside by the establishment and from the outside by its, by its outcasts and rebels. So for me, um, pirates don't work because pirates, they never lived here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, and really not much in Florida. Uh, Gasparilla or Jose Gaspar is, um, is a mythical creature. He was made up. And he was made up by the elites of this town in 1904. So to reflect certain things about Tampa's establishment. So therefore, he's no rebel. Um, and then the gangsters. The gangsters were very much a part of... Um, you know, the Tampa society and economy here. Um, if you think about it, they were selling Belita tickets and, and all these other things, and then they would take that money and launder it through the police department, who then would funnel it back to the, um, the organized crime, and then they would in turn buy off all the candidates for all the um, political um, campaigns. So much like the lobbyists do today, the gangsters would just buy both candidates. So no matter who won, so the gangsters were just really interested in money, but if anything, they were very much part of the structure here, uh, the power structure. And um, I find it unusual that Tampa spends so much time kind of chuckling in its sleeve about gangsters when really, if you think about it, the, the, the consequences um, of all that corruption are still with us today um, and have, I think, ham hampered Tampa's development. Um, in a big way. I mean, if, you know, we're the sin city of the South in the 1940s and 50s and all these gangland murders, you know, who wants to relocate a business there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, uh, maybe it's time that we get past the gangsters and we get past the pirates and um, uh, get on to other things. Now, if you want to look at people who really bucked the trend here in Tampa, you'd have to look at people like your labor organizers. Um, there was a couple guys in the 1930s, they were they were tarred and feathered for organizing um, labor demonstrations here, and they both died um, as a result. Um, we also had plenty of lynchings, and not just uh, racially uh, motivated, but labor uh, uh, motivated. We also had plenty of uh, civil and human rights activists. I mean, I think uh, if you really want to get into rebellion, you can talk about the civil rights movement. You can talk about people like um, James Hammond, Clarence Fort, Robert Helen Saunders people like that. But uh, today we're going to explore a whole another category, various misfits, and I think you'll understand what I what I mean when we get deeper into it. So see, these are some of the runners up when I was kind of meditating on who, you know, Jose Marti, of course, he never really lived here, uh, although he was a revolutionary in the most um, literate of the senses. Uh, Robert Helen Saunders, of course, Luisa Moreno um, was a woman labor activist here in the 1930s. And one of our Reardon fellows, um, Sarah McNamara, uh, is working on her dissertation about her and s some other activists. Um, so she's been somewhat uh, documented. Hudson Holloway, he was the, uh, the owner of the Seawolf restaurant who faked his death quite famously. And I could go into all kinds of stuff about that. And of course, Joe Redner, um, who uh, is you know, started with the strip clubs and has kind of moved into more of a political direction. Uh, they were, oh, uh, Robert and Helen Saunders, they were the head of the NAACP. Uh, Robert took over from um, um, Harry T. Moore, who was blown up. Uh, he was dynamited on Christmas Day, along with his wife. Um, so he was killed. So for Robert Saunders to come and step in in the late 50s is the next state secretary of the NAACP really took a lot of guts. Um, so let's go, let's start with our first guy. Um, our first fellow is actually represented in the exhibit. Some of his photographs are there. Uh, Jose Ramon Sanfeliz is, is actually on the left. You can see his gleeful smile there. Uh, he's sitting across from Samuel Burgert. So um, 
Samuel Berger's son went on to form the the Berger Brothers um, commercial photography firm. So uh, this is around the turn of the century, probably uh, shortly after the turn of the century. Um, and Jose San Feliz came from Cuba as a cigar worker. He arrived here um, probably around 1890. It's hard to say exactly when, but um, uh, and he was a uh, in addition to being a cigar worker, one of his hobbies was taking photographs. Um, and it's lucky for us that uh, many of his photographs still exist. Um, so uh, what's interesting about San Feliz and the reason why I include him here is because he represents the, the kind of political trajectory that a lot of immigrants took when they arrived here in Tampa. Uh, many of them arrived from places like you know Sicily, northern Spain, Cuba, all places where the people had really been politicized by um, privation, uh, by oppression, war, things like this. All of them had gone through similar kind of traumatic experiences as a result of the Industrial Revolution and political uh, things. So, you know, he arrived as a political firebrand. You know, he, he wanted to take down the cigar producers and uh, power to the people and all this stuff. And... Um, he was very active not only in the Cuban independence movement here in Tampa, um, and Jose Marti, of course, was uh, was a big representative of that when he came to town, but um, he was also really into the uh, the labor movement here. And w what's interesting is what happens to him over the, the next 30 years or so. In 1897, there was another big strike that stopped all the work in the cigar factories. So he, he did what a lot of people did. They just hopped on a st steam uh, ship and went back to Cuba. The problem was in 1897, Cuba <laughs> Cuba was being completely torn apart by its, uh, its war for independence. Uh, if you were to get somewhere in between the Spanish and the Cuban sides during that war, you would be, uh, you know, you'd be killed or imprisoned in very short fashion. So he found that the situation in Cuba was no longer to his liking. Um, I actually have a quote here. He said, uh, uh, when he took his family back, we found that we could no longer endure life in wartime Cuba as we had become too accustomed to life of comfort and ease in Ybor City and that we, we, we could not find in Cuba. So, um, dictated by, uh, you know, by his income and his family's comfort, he, he came back here to Tampa. And at that point, he started to take a lot more photographs after this point. Um, and I think it's, it's probably because he decided to kind of cast his pail down here and, and make this his new permanent home. Um, and what's, what's so interesting about it is that when he finally collected a lot of these photographs into a collection and made an album out of it, it's who he gave it to as a gift. He gave it to D.B. McKay. Now, D.B. McKay, um, if, if you don't uh, know about him, he was a uh, four-time mayor of Tampa. Um, he was the editor of the Tampa, I believe it was the Tampa Daily Times, and, um, uh, and was just a power broker. He was also kind of the head of this... Um, Oh, uh, committee of vigilantes. Anytime there would be a labor stoppage, a strike at Ybor City, these people took it upon themselves to um, get on their horses, grab an axe handle, and go to Ybor City and start cracking skulls. Um, you know, whenever the cigar industry lost money, lost money, the city of Tampa lost tax revenue as a result. So people like McKay took it very personally. Anytime somebody would go on strike. Um, sometimes they would wear white hoods when they rode. Sometimes they didn't wear white hoods, but um, they were always up to the same thing. And the thought was was that um, the workers were easily led. They were sheepish, and if you just got rid of the agitator, um, uh, the the labor leaders, then everything would be okay. So this Shanghaiing people. Um, there was a couple labor leaders who ended up on the coast of Honduras after being um, shanghaied on a ship and thrown on a beach in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea where they were. So this kind of stuff happened all the time. So it's rather interesting that our, our man Feliz, uh, San Feliz, gave D.B. McKay this album as a gift. And I think it shows how long in 30 years it, he went from being kind of the revolutionary firebrand to being a good American man, you know, who wanted to, uh, who had things to protect, you know, he wanted to protect his family, protect his job, et cetera, et cetera. And although he, he went all around the country doing work, uh, all different kinds of work, he always 
you know, used Tampa and Ybor City as his touchstone. So, although he's not the wildest of the rebels, I think he represents a much bigger, um, uh, something much bigger than himself. And what's so, I guess, uh, so valuable about his work are pictures like this. This is a picture of a soup kitchen. Whenever the workers went on strike, there would be things like uh, they would put up these soup kitchens immediately. Now, someone like D.B. McKay would never deign to point a camera in the direction of any of these people. I mean, first of all, you can see they're they're uh, they're dark skinned, and they they represent something that's uh, that Tampa's establishment is extremely hostile to, which is labor unions. And even today, there's sort of a divided history, you could say. Um, uh, depending on which side you ask about uh, what parts of Tampa history are um, uh, the most interesting. But uh, he was one of the only people, I think these are some of the only pictures of, of Tampa kind of uh, labor activities of that era that we have. So this is before the, um, the turn of the century, uh, really important. So uh, moving on, let's get into some more revolutionary territory. Uh, and we're going in that direction with Mr. Marcelino Arguez. And now I do, I'm, I'm pretty certain that his first name is Marcelino, or was. Um, he, uh, he grew up in Spain. He was a surveyor by trade. Uh, and he, he got an illness at some point in middle age. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of him. But he, uh, he eventually started reading up on hydrotherapy. Um, and when we tend to think of hydrotherapy, we think of baths and all these things. And really, we think of water, but most of the time, it's simply using water as a vehicle for heat and coolness and things like this. And it's a way to, um, to heat and cool different parts of the body. So um, he, he uh, ended up treating himself with hydrotherapy successfully. And when he had uh, some, there were some ailments in his family, he did the same thing. And, and every time he treated them successfully until he had people coming to his door and he was spending more time on hydrotherapy than it was on surveying, so he ended up giving that up. He moved, who knows why, he moved to uh, Tampa in 1906. A lot of revolutionaries uh, kind of tended to um, coalesce around Tampa for whatever reason. And he opened up a practice in 1906, a naturopathy clinic. Now, what's so interesting about, about um, Mr. Arguez is, you know, first of all, he's a doctor. Um, and he considers himself a revolutionary. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a good reason for this. First of all, um, he believed in a drugless system of, of medicine. Uh, he believed that, um, you know, the, the medical establishment um, existed for profits first, and, uh, and secondly, it might make some people better. Um, he was also way ahead of his time. I mean, first of all... Um, the hydrotherapy was one thing, and that was kind of, it, it, it uh, was very trendy in the Victorian age. Um, so he kind of rode that wave. But also, he, um, uh, he was very interested in the diet. So not only did he have this place, Banos del Sol, which means baths of sun, but uh, downstairs he had a vegetarian restaurant that served only vegetarian food. Now, unless you come from like a Cuban or a Spanish background, it's hard to to understand just how revolutionary a, a, a vegetarian restaurant would be in the 1910s, 1920s. I mean, even for American food, a lot of people think, you know, unless you eat meat, you know, uh, every day, um, you're not going to be healthy. And certainly the Cubans believe that too. So this must have been a very hard sell, I think, for the people um, of Ybor City. But he also put out a journal called Science and Reason, uh, in which he, he put forth his arguments about... Um, about medicine, and that's where I actually have some quotes from him. It was, it was put out bilingual, so it was in English and Spanish. And he said things like this, um, we know that the vested medical interests are not only waging war against us, but that we are they are also conspiring against the spreading and propagation of our doctrines. Because we ardently desire the triumph of truth, we are asking the intelligent people of this fair city to cooperate with us in this glorious fight against the forces of error. Um, so uh, in addition to his you know, Turkish baths, electric light baths, all kinds of different showers, um, and basically what you would do is uh, you'd go through a bunch of these different bath procedures, massage, you would end up with uh, some really powerful showers with jets that kind of shot at you from every direction. Um, 
and then finally you would uh, he would put you on a vegetarian diet. But before he did this, he would want to clean out your system, so he had something um, he called the grape cure. Now, um, if you were not in gastrointestinal distress when you went to Mr. Arguez, um, you would definitely be in distress after you left uh, because the, the grape cure was this idea, first of all, um, the, the, the waters of hydrotherapy were meant to help you get rid of toxic liquids in the body. To get rid of the solids is where the grape cure came in. So you would start with two ounces of grape in a, grapes in a sitting, and you would slowly eat more and more until you ate close to a pound in a sitting. And you would get up to seven times a day. So it would be, you know, I don't know, probably about six pounds every day of grapes. And that's all you ate. Now, you can imagine the kinds of effects this might have on your body. Um, but it would be certainly effective in cleaning out uh, anything that might be there. So um, his grape cure, was he considered it a gift to the world. But um, what's interesting is that even though uh, the hydrotherapy and the, the grape cure maybe sound a little extreme, he's really on to some, some major things that, that we kind of take, uh, well, the medical establishment is still kind of trying to swallow today. For example, he writes... Um, one of the greatest difficulties we face daily is to convince our patients of the importance of diet in the treatment of disease. People, as a rule, are accustomed to eat disease-producing foods, and very often they like the most harmful products most of all. The prevailing ignorance considering food values is of such a nature that any food product excluding meat, fish, and eggs is not considered highly nutritious. And he writes, uh, to abstain from meat and fish is not enough. He also singled out denaturalized foods as poisoned. So, quote, refined sugar, white flour and its derivatives such as white bread, macaroni, spaghetti, cakes, pies, pastry are all shining examples of denaturalized foods. So, uh, such foods, as he put it, cause pathogenic, uh, pathogenic uh, substances um, to generate in the body. So that's where the hydrotherapy and the grape cure came in is get all these poisons out before they can do things like cause diabetes, cancer, etc. So... Um, and after he puts you on the grape cure, he would slowly put you on raw foods, sour milk, honey, and then eventually fruits and, and other vegetables. And then he gets you back uh, to a complete diet eventually. Uh, but the, from a money-making point of view, the, re the vegetarian restaurant is a great idea too because you know, anytime someone feels off, they can just um, come in and have a meal. I wish, wish, wish I had a menu for that restaurant um, have no idea what he served. Probably a lot of grapes. Um, so that was uh, that was him. Um, and what, one of the interesting things about his setup was on the roof of his building is where he built a glass enclosure. So it was like a greenhouse. And that's actually where the baths were so that you'd have natural light come in. And then there was a, a partition between the men's side and the women's side so they could both have their privacy. All right, so moving on to our next rebel, our next misfits. Um, Jose Luis Savannah. Uh, we have his papers here and his father's papers um, here at Special Collections. Um, this is one of his normal looking pictures. Um, Mr. Avellanal, he was, uh, oh, ever since he was born, I think in the 19 teens, he was a, a troubling and troubled person. Um, now, uh, first of all, I mean, I think. Uh, I should introduce by saying that his father was uh, ran a clinic in Ybor City. There was no major hospitals in Ybor City back then. There was a lot of collectivized medicine. So the best places to go were the, the clinics and the social clubs. So his father ran a clinic. Um, and uh, I think in some ways he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps, but didn't want to go through all the work involved. Um, so, for example, I, I think, first of all, his dad starts really got tired of treating his friends because he was always hurting his friends. He put a, uh, I think he put a friend's eye out uh, by shooting it with something. He also fashioned his own electric chair as a child and, and tested it on his friends. Um, so that was more people going to his father's clinic. Finally, his father um, had had enough and had kind of locked him in his room and he escaped, uh, stole his father's car, but I think he was like seven or eight years old and couldn't even drive. So he didn't get very far, but eventually ended up in, uh, in a military school in Georgia. Um, and after that, um, 
he's his uh, reputation just kind of got wilder and wilder. Uh, he was arrested in Tennessee, uh, apparently for drugging a woman and perhaps taking advantage of her. Um, it's it's kind of unclear. But after that, he was very paranoid about this. So actually, in his collection, there are consent forms for women uh, who he wanted to bed, um, and it said things like, "We're not getting married." You know, we're uh, we're just having a good time, etc. So um, that alone is um, well, kind of ahead of its time. I've heard in my own day of um, of, of real consent forms like that. Um, but uh, so he was he was I think kind of paranoid after that. His main scientific, if you want to call it that, preoccupation was life after death. So he was he was convinced that he could freeze. Uh, people, animals, and bring them back to life later. Um, and no neighborhood cat was safe in Ybor City while he was around. Um, his favorite thing was, you know, grab a, a stray cat off the street and throw it in his freezer and then later try to bring it to life. And, of course, I don't think he ever had any success, um, and I wouldn't trust him if he said he did. Uh, but uh, so he ended up kind of uh, squatting, or he ended up in the... the uh, the El Pasaje Hotel, um, which today is still, it's on 9th Avenue, a very recognizable building with a series of arches in the passageway. But uh, he was there for a long time. And uh, um, in addition to all of his other craziness, like writing these theses on life after death, he had a diploma mill uh, called um, Southern University. So basically, you know, he gave these, you know, he gave law degrees out like it was candy to his friends. Um, and he himself, he ran for state senator once. And in, uh, in his ads, he had every kind of, you know, JD, PhD, MA, every kind of thing you could imagine, uh, certificate and degree. And of course, he never, he didn't, he didn't earn any of them. Um, eventually, his, his, the charter was, re was revoked for Southern University. How he got a charter for a non-existent university in the first place i don't know but um i think later on there was a court case about it and he quickly tried to draw up some uh, schedule of courses and try to get some people who said they were instructors so that's represented in this collection as well um but uh so in addition to all this other stuff supposedly being a lawyer you know he in addition to um a lot of other cases he represented the what the grand duchess anastasia supposedly um of the uh, the old Romanov dynasty, uh, he also claimed to be a gynecologist, a plastic surgeon, um, and one thing that we do know he was he was just incorrigible uh, with women, and uh, he ended up um, uh, also starting something called the Pan American Alliance, something like this, um, and it was a. It was a real trumped up organization where they gave out uh, all kinds of awards to people. So for, they singled out of all people for one of their awards, uh, Fulgencio Batista. He was the dictator who came before Castro. So um, he certainly didn't uh, <laughs> didn't um, deserve a, a humanitarian award. But uh, anyway, Avianal was just a, a crazy character. Later on, subsequently, some of these ghost tours and things online have said that he was a serial killer and he, you know, uh, lured women to his father's clinic where he'd murder them and put them in tubs of acid. And it's all just a fiction made to sell ghost tours or whatever. But he did kill a lot of cats. So, um, so moving on. Oh, here's another picture of our Avanel. It's very much, very much into the occult. I think he really wanted to impress women. He had this mystic room with, you know, black candles, crystal balls, the whole bit. So I think that picture kind of says it all. So moving on, some of the people who have been around Tampa longer may remember Jim Fair. Um, you know, as, we, as we're going along, we're going away from kind of the farcical stuff into stuff that really touched a nerve here in Tampa, and Jim Fair certainly did. Um, he was born to a well-to-do family, part of Tampa's elite, uh, the Farrier family. Um, he ended up, uh, he went to Plant High. He was voted most, most likely to succeed in all this stuff. He was a real social butterfly. But something happened um, during his service in World War II. He, was, uh, he served in the Navy. His ears were completely shot by uh, serving on battleships and other ships like this, have, constantly have cannons go off. And I don't know if a screw got loose somewhere or something, 
Um, while he was, while he wasn't crazy, he wasn't right with the whatever you know the situation was, and inst- he, he quickly uh, during the 1940s and early 50s really got tired of the country club uh, atmosphere, um, hanging out with all these elites, and completely reoriented oriented himself and started a business downtown called the Salvation Navy. Um, this was just a couple blocks from the Salvation Army, and you could get a hot meal, you could get anything. He had a huge library there of like 40,000 volumes. It was all leftist type literature and stuff on labor and things like that. Um, and uh, it had none of the trappings of the Salvation Army, meaning if you wanted to sit down and have a meal, you didn't have to pray with him. You didn't have to say that you were Christian. You didn't have to say that you did anything wrong. Um, so it was no surprise that the homeless people and people who really needed help started to flock to the Salvation Navy instead of the Salvation Army. Um, now, he had a, a huge warehouse just, just full of stuff. And one of the things that he did for his whole life, I think, was just compulsively collect things and then give them away to, uh, to anyone who would find them of value. So um, uh, the other thing that he was really well known for for his whole life, uh, in addition to collecting all this garbage and stuff, was um, lawsuits. He, he uh, must have filed thousands of lawsuits here in the state of Florida, maybe beyond, I don't know. But um, he was constantly uh, scrutinizing city plans and things like this. So, for example, one of the causes that he got into was this, um, I think there was a new bridge they were planning to Davis Island and some rights of way and stuff. And he saw that there was a lot of property owners that specifically were going to benefit from the project. Um, and then there was other things like anytime the uh, – uh, the utilities tried to raise rates. He would always file a lawsuit, and many times he got Florida Power to not raise their rates. I don't know what his uh, success rate was against Tico, um, but um, but that was you know the, one of the other things he was constantly involved in. Um, so it didn't take long before the press completely fell in love with this guy. I mean, although he was a misfit, although he was completely out of step with Tampa politics. Uh, he was always wearing funny hats. He was just theatrical, um, and he was, you know, he wasn't a pushover, and he wasn't um, adult, I would say, you know. I mean, he could make some really reasoned arguments. So they were constantly putting microphones and, and um, cameras in his face to try to get, uh, uh, you know, commentary on the latest thing. And so uh, he became kind of a fixture in the Tampa community really quickly. He was also running for office. He really wanted the mayorship of Tampa very badly. Um, and he eventually, in 68, he shocked everybody by becoming supervisor of elections. Um, and when he moved into the office, he kind of turned it into another Salvation Navy. Uh, you know, he pushed together a bunch of desks to make a big cooking area so they could cook. So there's hippies and old people, I mean, uh, homeless people hanging out in the office. He's hiring, uh, I mean, uh, firing the uh, permanent help that he had there and replacing them with friends from the Salvation Navy. Now, none of this was illegal. Um, and, you know, just because people were surprised by the way he ran the office didn't mean that he was breaking any laws exactly, but it sure bothered everybody. Um, and it got to the point where uh, Governor Claude Kirk had him removed from his position. Um, he wasn't actually able to do this until some recent le- legal changes before, and the person he removed before fair was a very felonious Florida sheriff. Um, so he put Jim Fair on the same level as this uh, as this real felon and corrupt guy. But um, Fair ended up, long story short, um, things went really badly beginning in the early 70s. Um, he was arrested a couple times for really uh, minor things like um, petitioning on city property was one of them. And then there was some kind of assault charge that he got at a party. And basically, um, he could have walked away, but he refused to apologize or acknowledge that he did anything wrong. So the judge really uh, saw this as an opportunity, I think. And not only... Uh, uh, was he run out of Tampa on a rail, but he was sent to Chattahoochee State Mental Institution. The judge uh, brought in a psychiatrist who ruled that he was unfit, um, so he was sent to Chattahoochee. And back then, 
that was, you know, that was a rail out of town and there was no return route. You didn't get out of Chattahoochee very easily. And he spent about six horrifying months there, which really, I think, changed him for the worst even more. Um, and, but he did one thing when he was there. He, he managed to file a single lawsuit um, that allowed prisoners in Chattahoochee to have legal counsel. Before that, when you were sent to Chattahoochee, that was it. You don't get a lawyer. You don't get anything. Uh, you don't get out till the state says you can come out. Um, and when another judge reviewed the case, he was really shocked um, that he was there at all. Um, he said, uh, political systems opposed to democracy use these tactics. He's talking about other countries do this sort of thing to troublemakers. Um, so Jim Fair, after six months, was able to get out of Chattahoochee, but he, resi he resolved never to come back to Tampa for as long as he lived. When he was, while he was absent, the city of Tampa condemned the Salvation Navy, uh, bought the property and tore it down, um, and then also uh, took his warehouse and everything in it. And they, uh, you know, they put it before a board and they gave him some money for his trouble. Uh, but he would have to come to Tampa to sign some documents. And first of all, he thought that the, the property had been stolen from him. It's actually on the on-ramp to um, the Crosstown Expressway on this, the far side here in Tampa. But uh, uh, so that's they were making room for that. <clears throat> but uh, so even though there was hundreds of thousands of dollars waiting for him here, he would never come back to Tampa. What's interesting is what happened later. He, he surfaced in Tallahassee. He um, he never started another business, but he collected all the junk in his yard for which they tried to have things removed. He eventually, I don't know why, he he collected five AMC Gremlin cars, if you remember those. All these green Gremlin cars, had five of them in the yard. Eventually, they, they couldn't, uh, the, the city just didn't, I don't think he had the political will to, um, to go to war with Jim Fair and all of his friends. The thing was, was that although he was a complete outcast here, Although Tallahassee is very conservative, he was beloved in Tallahassee. I mean, when he left Tampa, uh, Channel 13, the Tampa Daily Times, and the Tampa Tribune all said they would never do a story on him unless he died because they had done, they'd uh, already covered him so much. Now, that was, that was their decision, not his. But um, so he would, uh, uh, when he left, went to Tallahassee, um, he was a darling uh, of the press. And um, in the late 80s, they did a 100 Greatest Reasons to Love Tallahassee, and he was number six out of the 100. Uh, Leroy Collins, probably our, our best governor in our history, was 18. Um, so I think that, that tells you something. So I think Jim Fair tells us more about Tampa. His story tells us a little more about Tampa than it even does about him. Oh, the farriers, they're around. Yeah, they're they're And, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly what went wrong, uh, you know, with his relations with his family. I think it was it was on his end, you know, um, but uh, th there may have been perceived slights and who knows. But uh, all that happened kind of around the same time that he kind of just disavowed uh, life. But he, he uh, or uh, the, I should say the um, privileged life. Uh, but he died in the early 90s and uh, was a cult figure there. And I don't think anybody in Tampa shed a tear, or at least uh, the people who were responsible for getting him out of here. The interesting thing about the judge that sent him away was he later was impeached for some of his own misdoings. Um, and uh, not less of which would be sending someone like Jim Fair to, to Chattahoochee. All right, so let's get on to our, our final miscreant, um, Frederick Waite novel. Now... The picture is not Frederick Waite novel. It's it's Rasputin. Um, I, I we don't have a picture of Waite novel, but according to accounts, it looks something like that. Uh, he had very long hair, a bushy beard, although his hair was very thick and and curly, so that would be a little different. And uh, that that becomes important when discussing his hair tonic. So, um, all right. So Frederick Waite novel, without a doubt, the kind of the most cartoony character. Tampa has ever produced. I mean, it helps that he died in 1902, so there was no pictures. We don't really have much to, to go on uh, except for some newspaper accounts and other things. So the best we know is he came from Russia. We don't know this. That's just what he told people. Um, he said that he had 
swam an icy river to escape a, a, a czarist gulag and came here to Tampa, God knows why, but um, like so many other people, the, the revolutionary road led here. Um, so he ended up here and told everyone he was a doctor, but he had no degrees to, you know, to speak of. He said he had gone to Berlin and Moscow University. Um, and eventually he went before the Florida Medical Board arguing that he should have, he should be giving a license. And they, uh, they, they had saw no reason to give him a license, but he harangued them until they finally uh, granted him a license. So um, in addition to uh, treating you know, various kinds of disorders, rheumatism, I think was one of them, and, uh, but he was a specialist in female complaints, uh, venereal disease, unwanted pregnancies, things like this. That was, uh, and then in addition to all that, to make a little money on the side, he sold hair tonic. Um, and he was probably the best poster child, you know, having these, these really thick locks. And his, his kind of daily uh, regime was he would go to Bayonet Point to swim. And at the time, everyone went to picnic on Bayonet Point. It was a very uh, popular place. So he would go down there, but he wasn't like a, a typical swimmer. He'd go there and um, he would lay on his back in the surf and kind of float like an otter. He'd have a cigarette and he'd have a newspaper. And then he'd have a plate of oysters like perched on his chest and he would sit there and read the paper smoke slurp oysters and um and then of course when he got out he'd shake his locks everywhere so everyone could see how you know glorious his hair was and everything um and so he made quite a spectacle of himself that way um but then that was really just the beginning um he ended up squatting in old fort brook fort brook wasn't really a big fortification. It was like a, an oversized house, I guess. But um, uh, he ended up squatting there after it was decommissioned, after the Seminoles were no, no longer a threat. And he lived there with a bunch of other squatters. And at some point, the city was trying to get them out of there. Um, they couldn't get them out. Eventually, as a, a kind of a defiant gesture, all the squatters elected Wait Novel mayor of Fort Brook. And he renamed it Moscow, and they said they were their own city. You know, uh, Tampa had no jurisdiction anymore, et cetera. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is that although he got this reputation as such a kind of incorrigible character, um, there was a lady uh, at the time who lived just outside of Tampa, Julia Daniels Mosley. Um, she was a very proper woman. Um, she did not hang out with uh, oh, unbecoming people. And her quote was, I shouldn't like him often, but once in a while, I enjoy him very much. So he sounded like one of those guys that you could take in moderation. But um, So he did a lot of things here in Tampa. In addition to starting his own um, medical practice, he also started uh, something known as a Humanist League. Um, humanism was kind of big in the 1900s as an alternative to Christianity as a worldview where you... Um, you espouse certain natural, universal natural light, uh, rights, human rights, things like this. Um, so uh, he started the Humanist League, and they had a parade uh, in Ybor City, and I just, the float um, was so subversive. They had a horse-drawn float, and they had Lady Liberty depicted on the back of the float, but it was a black man dressed in drag. Now, they got away with that in Ybor City, but if they had gone down, like, Franklin Street, with that get up, uh, I think they probably all would have been thrown in jail or who knows, maybe lynched. Um, the other uh, organization he started was the Free Love Society. Now, um, he could only get men to join the Free Love Society, apparently, <laughs> because when they had the first Free Love banquet, it was only him and 30 other men. Uh, but uh, all the servers were African-American women who were naked head to toe. They had this, uh, this event at the old Habana Hotel in Ybor, which had these really long, full-length windows, like most of the buildings back then. <clears throat> and so anybody walking by could see what was going on. And course after course was being uh, fed to these guys. They all arrived like with pseudo-military attire and these colorful sashes and all these medals that meant nothing. Um, and uh, so they're eating a course after course, and every course was laced with a different kind of aphrodisiac, supposedly. So I'm not sure how Wait Novel thought this feast was supposed to end, 
but um, it never did come to a conclusion because everyone was arrested. Even the people in Ybor City couldn't take this kind of effrontery. Um, you know, even an anarchist, uh, you know, could could be uptight about something like this. So he was thrown in jail, and that wasn't the last time. Um, the last time he was thrown in jail was um, because a well-born woman named Irene Randall came to him for an abortion. Um, she was impregnated by her who she thought was her fiance, but he ended up leaving town. So uh, she came to to Weight Novel, and this, this you know, establishes an important uh, idea here. It's mainly the well-to-do people that are using his services. Poor people couldn't afford to, you know, couldn't afford an abortion most of the time. So, um, so for that reason, he harbored a lot of really important secrets for people, and. When uh, he was eventually, he was arrested when Irene Randall died. Um, I'm not sure if it was internal bleeding. Um, people uh, think it was a it was an infection of some sort. But she ended up dying about 48 hours after she had her abortion. And uh, he was arrested. And um, the first trial was it was the trial of the century. I think it was 1899 or 1900. And uh, he um, he was acquitted. It was a hung jury. They retried him again, and this time they, they really wanted him, I think, in a bad way, and um, eventually uh, he was uh, found guilty. But in the interim, he lived in jail for quite a while, and he had the run of the place. Um, apparently, he was impossible not to like. Um, so all the jail guards liked, liked the guy. Uh, they left his cell door open so he could come and go. He had a valet in jail uh, who brought him borscht every afternoon to eat, and... Um, you know, he spent his time devising whirly gigs to fan himself and his locks in jail and all this stuff and um, wore these duck skid coats and was very unusual. Anyhow, uh, his, his stay in jail ended on a sad note because he was, he was sentenced to 10 years of hard labor. Um, and he was already in his 60s. He wasn't in good health. He knew there was no way he was going to survive his sentence. So his orderly brought him a, a cyanide capsule and he committed suicide. Um, that was in 1902. So, um, and now, Wait Novel, if you look his name up, um, I don't know what that name is, by the way. It's not Russian. His middle name was Leontif, which I guess sounds kind of Russian. Um, but uh, if you look up his name, he he's on lots of ghost tours uh, on the internet, and you can still see his shadow, supposedly, in the, sh in the windows. But uh, ghost tour, no ghost tour, it's a fascinating story. Um, and what was interesting was the judge said um, when he was sentenced that if his ledgers, uh, his uh, ledgers for his practice were made public, they would just rip the society, uh, the fabric of Tampa society apart. Er, you know, nobody would uh, escape without egg on their face. So, um, so certainly a fascinating guy. So just to recap real quick, um, we talked about Jose San Feliz, the one-time revolutionary and his photographs. We talked about Dr. Arguez and his revolutionary hydrotherapy and especially his uh, his insights on uh, the human diet. We've got a Vayanal with his uh, diploma mill, oh, his incorrigibility, his frozen cats, and his crystal balls. And Jim Fair, his lawsuits, Chattahoochee, um, you know, uh, a devil in Tampa, an angel in uh, Tallahassee. And then finally, the ne'er-do-well Frederick Waite novel. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. I don't think so, no. I mean, it's certainly not the glass enclosure thing. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, his first practice burnt down in 08. There was a big fire that kind of wiped out Ebor then. But uh, the second one was the three-story facility, the big one. But as far as I know, I don't think it survived. Um, well, let's see here. Uh, San Feliz, um, he died in 56. He was born in 1870. Um, Arguez, I'm not sure when he was born. I think he died in the 20s, uh, the 20s or the 30s. But um, 
Yeah, it's it's hard to say. That would be, but that would be around the turn of the century. If Al uh, was born, I believe, in the teens, and then he died like in 1980, somewhere around there, the early 80s. And in his older years, he looked like instead of looking like I don't know, dervish, he looked like a generalissimo. You know, he had all the medals and all that stuff. Jim Ferry died in 92. He was born, I think, also in the teens. And then Wait Novel, he died in 02, and we have no idea when he was born or where he came from. There's another picture of uh, V and Al enjoying a tipple and a smoke. All right. <laughs> 